I'm Jamie Alexander, Director of Drawdown Labs at Project Drawdown. Welcome to the Drawdown Roadmap for Business. When you think about business and climate change, what comes to mind? Maybe you think business is a force for good, making the world run, providing good paying jobs, manufacturing products that we all demand, and making serious strides toward reducing their environmental footprint while they do. But others of us have some questions. Wait, didn't business largely create this problem in the first place? Can endless economic growth exist on a finite planet? Is it possible for capitalism to persist in the era of climate change? And it makes sense that there are these differing perspectives. Because on the one hand, we see lots of statements and promises from companies about their sustainability. Net zero by 2050, we are a climate positive company, etc. But on the other hand, we see contradictions. Because while these big promises and proclamations are being made by companies about their sustainability achievements, often these same corporations are delaying and opposing climate action through side doors. Companies are pursuing emissions reductions in their sustainability teams, while their investments, lobbying activities, governance practices, trade associations, the products they sell, and their relentless focus on growth completely overshadow any incremental reduction in emissions. But what if we were all rowing in the same direction? What if business existed as an intentional, proactive, and engaged part of the solution, actively using their vast resources to help bring about a just climate future? What if business functioned more like an ecosystem and was actually the culmination of thousands of passionate individuals working together with government, activists, advocacy groups, communities, tribes, and more as collaborative agents of change? Well, in this unit, we'll explore a drawdown-aligned standard for business climate leadership, one that aligns all parts of the business with an equitable climate future, a standard that's only achievable by engaging workers throughout the business, making sure that from the procurement team to the marketing department to HR, every job is a climate job. Let's get started. If you're watching this, you likely already know Project Drawdown. Maybe you know us from the New York Times bestselling book we published in 2017. But since then, our organization has emerged as one of the world's leading resources for climate solutions for governments, businesses, investors, and communities. We showed that the world already has at our fingertips the solutions to the climate crisis. Solutions that can shift us away from fossil fuels to renewable energy like solar and wind, shifting our agricultural practices to those that are regenerative for the soil, eating more plants and less meat and much, much less food wasted. Solutions that will enable us to keep people cool as temperatures warm in ways that don't contribute to greenhouse gas pollution. Addressing building efficiency, green roofs, solutions that will enable us to remake our cities so that they're more equitable and walkable and bikeable and connect people without having to get in a personally owned vehicle at all opportunities to transform our relationship with nature so that we exist together with instead of at odds with nature, and solutions that support more people in having access to equitable reproductive health care and high quality education. These are fundamental human rights and they have cascading benefits to the climate. So we have the solutions to climate change. We know that these solutions are sufficient if scaled to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But these climate solutions don't scale themselves. Now, in the limited window, we have to make huge changes. We need to leverage the world's most influential actors to use their vast resources to help scale climate solutions in the world quickly, safely, and equitably. Enter the role of business. In many cases, it's businesses, the part of society that is most responsible for the emissions that cause climate change, that also have the scale, resources, and obligation to address it. Businesses can help us turn the tide, and if they want to exist in the age of climate change, then turn the tide they must. Here's how. This is the Drawdown Aligned Business Framework. This is really our effort at getting out on the table many more of the ways that companies can use their influence, clout, and resources to help the world achieve drawdown. Let's walk through each of these leverage points to explore how businesses can use their influence to support rapid, systemic climate action, starting with emissions reductions. John already reviewed with us how important reducing emissions is right now, job number one in the 2020s. 
So we need to greatly accelerate timelines here, not net zero by 2050 or 2040. What emissions reductions will we achieve by 2025, 2027, 2029, and how will we show it? And remember the time value of carbon, where similar to the time value of money, you know, if you're trying to save for retirement, you don't wait to start saving until you're 64. Climate solutions are cumulative. If we dramatically cut emissions in the 2020s and early 2030s, that's emissions that we prevented from going into the atmosphere. And that's the gift that keeps on giving. It's not just what we do, it's also how quickly we do it. Cutting emissions is always more important than carbon removal. And early action is most important. 75% of all the work that happens in the 30-year window needs to happen in this first decade. And in addition to the importance of the speed at which we act, businesses can also center justice in their climate action, which means collaborating with and being led by frontline communities that have often contributed the least to climate change. Seneca Solar, a solar developer owned and controlled by the Seneca Nation, is a leading example of this. Seneca Solar is leveraging experience from on-territory wind and solar projects to support corporate climate action and to help other native nations achieve energy independence at the same time, showing that values-aligned enterprise can be a vehicle for climate justice. So we just reviewed the emissions reductions dimension of business climate leadership, that box in the upper left. And that's where most business climate commitments end. But look at all these other ways that businesses can use their influence to help or hinder climate action in the world. Let's move on. Businesses operate in a complex ecosystem. Employees, customers, shareholders, their boards of directors, and their communities in which they operate. Businesses don't work in a bubble. So how are companies bringing in and enabling the climate superpowers of these stakeholders? For example, employees. Employees have tremendous power inside their companies, leveraging their skill sets, as we'll explore in more depth later, and holding their companies to the standard that this challenge demands. I'm not talking about employees implementing recycling programs or compost bins, although both are important. I'm talking about workers across the business, from warehouse workers to coders, delivery people to designers, supporting their company in moving faster and holding them accountable to their commitments. Pinterest is a great example of how authentic employee engagement can lead to rapid and impactful change. The company has a dedicated employee base that has catalyzed a strong and growing commitment to climate, encouraging employees across teams to find their climate inroads. A grassroots group of Pinterest employees helped establish Pin Planet, Pinterest's employee-led climate group that has grown to 400 members in just over a year. Pin Planet is made up of employees across all of Pinterest's verticals, not just sustainability. In fact, one of Pin Planet's members who started on the design team has since gone on to become Pinterest's very first global sustainability lead, showing that everyone's skills can be brought to bear in moving forward corporate climate leadership. Next up, products, partnerships, and procurement. It's always been nonsensical to me that a company can produce massive amounts of stuff that nobody really needs, and then they set emissions reductions targets and call themselves a climate leader. Climate change requires more than just making tweaks on the margins. Some products or clients may need to be phased out entirely, even if it means potentially leaving some business on the table. Look at who your clients are. Are you indirectly or directly supporting the fossil fuel industry or other extractive industries? You can have sustainability targets and simultaneously produce technology that helps oil companies drill more efficiently. The company Salesforce requires its suppliers to adopt science-based emissions reductions targets. That's one way of using the influence of the company to create positive climate ripple effects across the supply chain. And through Salesforce's Net Zero Cloud product, the company is also using their business superpower to help other companies lead on sustainability too. Next, investments and finance. We know that money holds a lot of power, much of which is currently still being funneled toward fossil fuels and other extractive industries. This makes capital a huge catalyst in hitting emissions reductions targets and financing climate solutions. Businesses can influence their banks by trying to encourage them to stop financing fossil fuels. They can provide green 401k options for their employees and more. 
As an example, five years ago, Patagonia was actively supporting the water protectors effort to halt the Dakota Access Pipeline when it realized that the banks directly funding the pipeline were some of Patagonia's largest banking partners. In other words, those banks were lending a portion of Patagonia's cash holdings to projects that actively undermined the company's values and mission. Since then, Patagonia has been on a mission to decarbonize its corporate cash, and more businesses can do the same. Next up, climate disclosures. Every business has climate-related risk and climate impact. It's critical that companies are transparent about their climate impacts. Every climate-leading company should publicly disclose their climate-related risk and support mandatory disclosure standards. This is table stakes. Climate-related disclosures are essential to allowing investors and the general public to be more sophisticated judges of a company's climate performance. People entering the workforce should have reliable data to turn to that discloses how a company is contributing to and addressing climate change so that they can factor that in when they decide where to work. The next pillar of the Drawdown Aligned Business Framework is climate policy advocacy. Businesses have a lot of clout when it comes to influencing policymakers at the federal level and also the state and local levels. Companies often also make political contributions that can affect key races for climate candidates. They're part of trade associations that can be big obstacles to passing climate policy. And many companies actually will only be able to achieve their climate targets with the help of policy in place to make it possible. So if a company is serious about their climate pledges, then you'll see them speaking out in support of strong climate policy early and often. We've been told by legislators time and again how influential the business voice can be in swaying legislators on critical pieces of legislation. Here's one example. A full-page advertisement that we placed in the New York Times to communicate the strong business support for federal climate policy. This and other business efforts were crucial in giving legislators the confidence that the business community supports strong climate action and it was crucial to the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022. And just for a moment, let's think back on those emergency break solutions that John mentioned in previous units. Might there be policy advocacy opportunities around methane, energy efficiency, stopping ecosystem degradation, focusing policy advocacy, not just on what's of interest to the business, but on what the atmosphere is telling us is important. Those would be high value places to focus lobbying efforts. Now, with these last two elements of business climate leadership, we're really getting to the core of the issue. Sustainability cannot be an add-on. It must be integrated into the business model of the company if it's gonna meet this moment. What would it look like to make climate central to the business model of every company out there? How many new employee skill sets and capacities might that bring to the table? How many new jobs? And again, science and the drawdown roadmap can help reflect what the atmosphere needs and where the business models of the future will be. Think of those emergency break solutions again. Maybe instead of a tech company that actively helps the fossil fuel industry drill more efficiently, that company pivots to helping identify and fixing methane leaks. Seventh Generation has aligned 100% of its business, its corporate giving, products, advocacy, and operations in service of stopping the climate emergency. Further, it's looked at how the dollars they spend annually on services like marketing, creative, and insurance impact the climate. Seventh Generation has committed to taking responsibility for impact from all of these sources. That's how you transform your business model to put a livable, equitable world at the center. And lastly, long-term thinking. For many of us, this one really gets at the heart of the matter. How do we move away from this incessant focus on short-term profit over everything else? Can climate-leading business help lead us to an economic model that values long-term thinking above short-term profit? Patagonia is a great example of a business advancing the broader conversation about the purpose of business. In giving away the company to planet Earth, the business made long-term sustainability and well-being a primary objective, as opposed to the primacy of shareholders' short-term gains. So, I know what you're thinking. This is a lot of stuff to be done, right? This is a lot. Especially when climate work tends to live with one team, a sustainability team that's often a small team, doesn't have a whole lot of budget, often an insignificant headcount, 
So this is a tall order. This is work that has never been done before, taking a large business enterprise and turning that ship around with no guide for how to do it. But when we start to actually look at climate action through a more holistic and integrated framework, it starts to bring more people in from more parts of the business to help. For example, when we look at more holistic emissions reductions goals, that's not just the sustainability team, that's also energy, strategy team, supply chain, procurement, operations. When we look at finance and investing, that brings in finance teams, of course, but also HR, investor relations. When you look at climate action in terms of stakeholders and how you can influence external groups, that brings in HR, marketing, community fairs, and beyond. So when you embed climate across the business and across every part of the business enterprise, it goes from being one small team trying to do it all to an ecosystem of new ideas, skill sets, diverse perspectives, all using their superpowers from wherever they sit to transform the business from the inside. So to recap, how can the science and the drawdown roadmap guide business to effective, smart climate action that matches what the planet, our atmosphere, is showing us to be true? Well, number one, deep emissions cuts today in the 2020s is priority number one. 2040 and 2050 targets are out of step with the science. 75% of action needs to happen in the 2020s. So set interim targets. What are businesses doing in the next one, three, five years? The science also shows business where to invest, where to divest, where to innovate, where to influence. The science shows business how to lead. For too long, we have been trying to put parameters and constraints around something that's uncontainable. But the climate crisis does not fit into our neatly defined boxes as much as we wish it would. We must enable climate work to happen everywhere, at all levels, and for the work to take a much broader shape than we've ever imagined. The science is clear. The atmosphere is telling us where to focus. Now it's up to all of us to lead the way. Let's get started.